as an objective to this hour and a half, we're going to pick up where we left off last time after we do one other thing. <laughs> There's always an intention that other things get in the way and we may never even get to the intention. <laughs> Oh, can we turn this light off because the reflection from this angle is compromised? How, does that work for you? Okay. Black. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 As the week progresses, you'll notice that Tim is using a number of Hebrew words, and I use a number of Hebrew words. And I barely even showed you the Aleph bit yet. So we want to do that. That's, that's the main thing for today. That was the intention. I wanted to give you that at the beginning so you knew what in the world we were talking about. But I want to mention one other thing first. Just to play into what Tim is telling you. And also Brenda had this very wonderful insight that I wanted her to, if you could, Brenda, in a moment. Uh, just in a, in a minute, though, not right this second. Go ahead and do what you're doing. But let me just say this about this week's talks, about what you're hearing. What Tim talked about last time had two parts to it, and they weren't necessarily coupled together. He presented them both as the same talk. But just so you know, this is not where... If you acknowledge one, you've got to acknowledge the other because they're independent concepts. Some of the things I'm talking about are also independent concepts. But just so, just so you know, Tim talked about in Genesis 1, perhaps it was the adversary getting kicked out of heaven that caused there to be this wrecked creation. Now, I remember hearing something about that. Gosh, maybe when I was in grade school or something, the, the, the fact that somebody said there was perhaps a whole different existing world between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. But I've never heard anybody elaborate about that. It's just a theory. But what Tim just did is elaborate based on the meanings of Hebrew words. Now, that's very helpful. But it also set up something that Edgar brought up, which is, Wait a minute, are you sure that it's okay to do that with those words? Now, regardless of whether the devil actually was kicked out of heaven and fell to earth between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, it can't really be proven so much because there's not a verse that specifically tells us that. However, once you start looking at the Hebrew words, I can certainly see why somebody would think so, that it's a possibility. Now, whether it's actually that is what happened, not necessarily, as Edgar said. So what we're trying to do is show you that there's stuff in Hebrew. Now, I probably, hopefully, have stirred up a lot of trouble, maybe even around the world, by suggesting people do this. And somebody could and probably has gotten mad at me for doing such a thing as to stir up somebody like... Tim to say, what? This means the devil got kicked out to the earth. And if somebody else says, no, that's not our doctrine, why, you rat, how dare you look at those words and turn them into that? But the problem is, whether I believe it or not, I can see how that can be read. So the question is, is it a possibility? Yes, it's a possibility. Is it absolutely so? Not necessarily. So there's other ways to read it. Just so you know, last year I was at a conference where it was about physics. And this one particular fellow, Greg Volk, he's this electron physicist, and he's brilliant. He's got all these wonderful things to say, and by invoking his name, which I seldom do, I'm honoring him such that if you hear his name, listen to what he has to say. He's got some great stuff. As he was describing the way the universe is composed with electrons and protons, I found a model for the first three days of creation in particular, regarding the construction of the universe dealing with protons and electrons, separating water from water, and noticing the bond between hydrogen and oxygen, which forms water. And it's all in the first three days. 
It has nothing to do with the devil being kicked out of heaven. And it also really has nothing to do with even what he made those three days, like saying, let there be light, separating water from water, and separating water from earth, and putting plant life in. Because what I was reading was the structure as he composed the elementary particles of matter, just like when he was reading from, what's this guy's name, Parkhurst, or what was it? John Parkhurst? Pa yes. Parkhurst. Yeah. As he was saying, oh, it's where you take the little individual pieces. Of course, he called them atoms. And then they were unassembled, and then he assembles them. But we now know that the atoms aren't the smallest particles. You can get down to electrons and protons, and then you've got string theory, which gets into quantum physics and this mess, which is what this conference was about. And what I found was that the first three days of creation, and I say three because that's before he lit the sun up and the moon, and there was something about that because he said, let there be light, but the source of light being from a solar object was not yet. So something different happened on day four, but the, the subject is so huge, I was just trying to concentrate on these three days. But what I'm telling you is that in looking at it from that perspective, it fit, astoundingly so, just about quantum particle physics. Who would have guessed? I hadn't ever had anybody teach me that, but in listening to Greg Falk and looking at the Hebrew words, I found a beautiful match. Now, that doesn't negate anything Tim was saying. It's just, well, which one of them is true? There's different parallels that are perhaps all of them true because there's these pictures which all fit. Now, that being said, let's look at Dawn for a minute. I just want to let you know you don't have to believe what he's saying. But if you do choose to believe it, a fellow told me a couple of years ago that you ought to be put to death. This is dangerous information. This is very serious. There was a man from Canada who I spoke to who knows Hebrew, knows the history, knows what he says he knows what the Jews have believed all through the course of time, and he says there's not any Jews that have ever held to the belief that the Sabbath day, or any day, would start in the morning. It's always in the evening. And he told me that if I didn't sanctify or call Kadesh, Kadosh, different vowels, which is to say, if I didn't hold in my heart and declare and actively participate that Friday at sunset was the beginning of Shabbat, then I ought to be excommunicated and stoned to death. And therefore, anything I say along those lines is also, in his mind, so corrupt, so satanically adversarial, that I can guess that if somebody gave him a badge and gave him the authority, he'd kill me. And this was just a couple years ago, regarding this subject. So I'm not telling you you have to believe this and promote this, but just know that if what he is saying is true, this is dangerous information. But as he said, it changes everything. Now, I happened to stumble into the study of this Dawn business when a fellow from New Zealand called a friend of mine and said, hey, can you prove when a day starts? It's right there in the Bible. Everybody knows. Just ask any Jew or any FDA. They'll tell you it starts at evening. They'll say, can you show me the scriptures where that proves it? Where do you go? Well, you go, to, you go to week one. He says six times in a row, he worked. There came to be evening. Then there came to be morning, and he called it a day. And people say, well, that's right. It started in the evening. Six days in a row, what's the last thing that happened before he called it a day? Boker. That's the last thing that happened, then he called it a day. And then he worked, there was evening, then there was morning, and then he called it a day. And then he worked, okay, six days in a row. I was talking to Andrew Gabriel Roth, and I invoked his name in great honor and esteem. He wrote, published the Aramaic English New Testament, A-E-N-T. He did a fantastic job. I regard him greatly. He completely disagrees. And I tried to talk to him and say, listen, I'm not trying to squabble with you or fight with you, but can you tell me why? If it says, 
he worked, then there came to be evening, then there came to be morning, and then he called it the day. The evening part is in the middle of that event, right? He worked, there's evening, there's morning. How can it start in the evening? Besides that, as Tim pointed out, evening is blending, which means you have to have light and dark. Because it's a blending. So if he starts where he does, in Genesis 1-1, where he says, okay, it was dark. Kosek, what does that mean? Tim went into that. But he starts with dark. There's no blending, because blending, you have to have two elements. He starts with dark. Okay, then he created light. Now you have two elements. Now he created two types of interface. So let me just show you one little thing but that I was thinking about this matter, and I'm just qualifying it. Because when I asked Andrew Gabriel Roth, he said, I'm just trying to understand the logic of why you don't see it this way. And he says, when, when Yahoo starts speaking, he tells you one thing, and if it's a circular thing, or if it's an extent, okay. And then he's gonna tell you again, but he doesn't end up at the tail, he goes back to the beginning. So different than the way Tim interpreted it, he would say when he says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, that's like the title. And then he says, now this is how it starts. So he goes back to the beginning. Okay, then he says, let the, it was dark, and he says, let there be light. Now, so Tim's reading it a whole different way. He says when he said, let there be light, I mean, when he created the heavens and the earth, that was an event. Can anybody prove that he's right and the other one's wrong, or that the other one's right and he's wrong? No, because there's two different ways to read it, mm -hmm. which is why you get different translations, which is why you get different denominations, which is why you get different doctrines, which is why you have people killing each other for the last 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years. I can't say he's wrong. I can say I wasn't taught that, and I don't know that I necessarily believe that, but I, don't know, I, I can't change my beliefs unless somebody presents information. So once he presents information, there's two jobs. One is to say, what is he saying? And if I can understand, that's the communication. We talked about that yesterday when Brenda said it's about intimacy. What does she mean by that? And I, I'm trying to understand what she is communicating. Now, once I have that communication, I can look at it, which is what Barry was saying, and I can say, do I agree or not? How does that fit? I mean, you try to put it on like putting on a shirt. Is it too big, too small? I mean, does it fit? Can I wrap my mind around it? Can I make it mine? I could say, well, Tim says, but can I understand it, own it, perceive it, which is the job that he can't do for us. I can't even do it for you showing you this alphabet, which is why I tried to make a point when, when Tim showed you Boker, Bet, Kuf, Rash, those are my words. He saw something in the assimilation together of Bet and Kuf and Rash, making Boker, and then looking at the different dictionaries. That's the task of doing this. So all we're doing here is saying, hey, here's some stuff. Here's some information that you have to pick up and make it your own. But I'm letting you know that if you go carrying this stuff around and showing people, hey, look, guess what? There's some people that are going to hate you and want to kill you and disassociate any fellowship from you <laughs> and say all manner of evil against you falsely for his sake of giving you some insight. It just might be true. Which is why people disfellowship. Which is why people are anathema, banned, cursed, ba'ashama, excommunicated. Which has happened to me and probably many others. So when Andrew said, what he does is he says, he created the heavens and the earth, and he goes back to the beginning. It was evening and then morning. And he goes back to the beginning. It doesn't mean it didn't start in the evening. To him, in his mind, it absolutely starts in the evening. Therefore, everything, he wrote a book called Wheel of Stars, which is this great book, very heady science, fitting the entire calendar together using the constellation. You have that book? It's a fabulous book. I'm not denying it. However, it's predicated. If I say two plus two equals five, and therefore, let me show you all the math that can extend out of that. You could say, yeah, but that's not true. Two plus two equals four, not five. Yeah, but look how fantastic you, things you can do if two plus two did equal five. And I could, I could construct a whole city, you might say, of, from the foundational building blocks of two plus two equals five. As a concept, that's valid. It's just an idea. But is it? Now, so if Andrew or anybody else says, because the day starts in evening, 
then this is what it looks like. They might be right. They might be right. But if what Tim's saying is right, no, it really starts in the morning, then theirs is 2 plus 2 equals 5. In which case, now we have to... But they're going to say, wait a minute, what if what Tim is saying is that 2 plus 2 equals 3? Maybe Tim's inventing this false world. And Tim is now showing us what, it, what this world looks like if 2 plus 2 equals 3, which is this whole other construction. So you can't say, ah, ah, no, 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 just it's a piece of art. Just look at what it constructs. Look at what this one constructs. Look at what that one constructs. Now you've got to figure out, are either of them right? But it's not about throwing rocks because Yahweh gave us these words. Mm -hmm. He gave us these words. Now in my entire life, for 50 years, I saw many different Bible translations, but I never had anybody show me the Hebrew word, like what he's just trying to show you and what I'm trying to show you. So all of a sudden it brings it back down to something else. We were, we were talking the other day that... At one point, 100 years ago or so, some supposedly well-meaning medical professionals were giving the indigenous people that used to live around here medicine that was alcohol blended with gunpowder to destroy their insides, to destroy their minds, to kill them. And then when they started getting cold, they gave them a nice warm blanket to take some comfort in, only it was laced with smallpox. And scarlet fever and typhoid and all sorts of other hideous diseases to exterminate that people group. Under the guise of being the priest, the, the doctor, the, oh, yes, I care for you here. And it was all a betrayal. Mm -hmm. And what I was suggesting the other day is, what have we been handed by the same folks, or the, certainly the same hearted people, all the while, we keep taking more medicine, and it's just destroying us because they know it's not medicine. And even if some of those practitioners who are dispensing this, thinking it was medicine, well, gee, it's, you know, gasoline mixed with gunpowder, and I'm supposed to drink that. Oh, it burns. Oh, yeah, it's good medicine. It's strong. <laughs> <sighs> the stuff that's gone on. So what I'm saying is just because we don't get it, we don't understand it, we haven't been told it, that... It, that it, just remember, there's that song that they use to program our mind. Give me that old-time religion. Good enough for Grandpa, good enough for Grandma and Uncle Joe. It's good enough for me. But see, this isn't a matter of what's good enough. And if they were lied to and intentionally destroyed by an adversary, there's no reason why we have to submit to that same thing. It's a matter of, do you have a heart for truth? Do you want to seek the truth? And there's this phrase, I was taught that if I betray the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to go to hell. Just like Judas. What does it mean to, to betray the Lord Jesus Christ? If I betray one of the doctrines that his spirit told the, West, the, the people who put together the Westminster Confession of Faith, that's the basic standard of the Presbyterian Church, it's basically denying the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore I'm going to go to hell. And there are some people who in the past, if they even thought to regard a Moed, Passover, they would be tortured, their family tortured, completely dispossessed, put to death, excommunicated, and doomed by the religious vicar of Christ on earth to go to hell. What you are doing here is so dangerous that years in the past we, we'd all be slaughtered. Burned at the stake at, at, at best and much worse. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you, Spanish Inquisition. This is dangerous words. A guy that I worked with, Alaskan Indian, native, his grandmother insisted on speaking her native tongue. So the missionaries cut her tongue out of her mouth. So he said, I will never have anything to do with the Bible or anything Christian ever again. I don't blame him. But do you know that 
The same thing is done for people who would speak Hebrew. It's not acceptable to keep the Sabbath day, to mention Yahweh's name. From what I understand, within the laws of the Talmud, anybody who mentions the name of yod heh vav -Hey, or tries to utter it, or even who teaches that the goyim, the non-Jews, should keep the Shabbat or any festival, according to the A line of Talmud, just like in the Quran, should be put to death. So according to the Jews, some Jews, I don't know who they are, but according to some Jews, I should be put to death. And for you listening, you should be put to death. Just so you know, the Christians want you put to death, the Jews want you put to death, and Islam wants you put to death. And the secular people who are sick and tired of the religious oppression also want you to put to death. So look around, this is your mishpacha, this is your family, and hopefully, if, if we don't jab each other too hard, you know, as we're trying to huddle for some sort of... Uh, Comfort. I mean, this is this is this is what we got. So I'm just telling you that this is no light-hearted stuff. And so if somebody says, "Man, I, I get good," are you sure you're translating that right? I feel an overwhelming burden that I better be right. Now that doesn't mean I'm I'm better than you or I'm more right than you. But there's this New Testament verse that says, "Don't let many of you." presume or assume to be teachers because the scrutiny, the demand upon you by Yahweh himself is, you better take this seriously. The, the burden upon you is that much more. So just, just so you know, I take this more serious, you might say, than life and death because it's, it's literally heaven and hell, whatever you make of those things. But what I'm saying, this is like, this is the ultimate of serious. I mean, look what they did to Galileo just for saying, gee, uh, maybe the, the earth goes around the sun instead of the sun around the earth. <laughs> that was so disruptive and he refused to recant so they said, come here. And they showed him the torture chamber. And he goes, okay, okay, okay. I'll shut up. Thank you, Yahweh, that it has not come to that. Okay. Yet, and may it never. But I'm just telling you what this information is. A movie came out called A Dangerous Mind. You know, whatever they were talking about, if you think about this stuff, you now are officially a dangerous mind, which puts you on some sort of political hit list for removal, just so you know. I'm not telling you that to scare you. I'm telling you that to realize what this stuff is. Because, because, now let me tell you another thing about prophecy. Daniel chapter 2. But before I tell you Daniel chapter 2, it depends on what the alphabet letters mean. Because the way I see it, the the only way that I can see it is not to apply doctrine, is not to take what somebody told this prophet, that seer, that preacher, that revelator. It has nothing to do with that. All I'm doing is looking at the letters. So I'm going to write down the Hebrew letters. We'll go through the alphabet. And then we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar's statue. But first, before we do that, Brenda, do you want to give a word of what you see? And this, what was the word again? Hosak. Hosak. So here, let me, let me just describe this real quick. Het, Sheen, Kaf. Now, actually, Kaf, uh, I, I write like kind of a short hand. It's actually like an open hand. And this is the, people write C-H. And just so you know, it's not Chanaka or Melchizedek. I write this C-X because it's a gravel sound. <laughs> So it's Mel. Actually, that's a K, not a CH. But, but most people call this letter the CH. Some people, if you were seeing a, a writing, they put an H with a. Because this happened to be the eighth letter, and our eighth letter is H. So if you see an H with a dot, or I write CX, or some people write CH, but generally it would be CH like that, but it's the Ch. KH. Excuse me? It's written KH. Okay, some people write that as a K. You're right. But see, the letter cough is a K, so it gets confusing, but that's one of the most confusing letters, just so you know. 
Anyway, this is either an S or an SH. In modern Hebrew, if there's a dot on the right side, if you're right, it's SH. If you're wrong, you're not right, and that makes it left. And if you're wrong, that's a sin, right? So if you put a dot on the left, this letter is called sin. If you put a dot on the right, it's called shin. That's one easy way to know. So in modern Hebrew, if it's the dot on the left, it's pronounced as an S. If a dot on the right, it's pronounced as an SH. And then this is the K sound, as in Melchizedek. So, so it's not an L. But it's more that's, I think maybe that's where they give you the, the KH sound. Maybe. Okay. Well, anyway, the, the real way to do a K sound is with also very similar to the Chet, so it's Chosech. But this is a harsher sound than a, Yes? A question. Uh, those vowel points, are those inspired? No. What I'm trying to They're get certainly at is put in by the Masrites, but see, Paleo doesn't use them, so I don't even, I just ignore them. I'm just putting them there so you know the difference between Sin and Shin. But here, this is why I'm saying, because she's going to show you something, but whenever you have a, the letter K at the end, it literally means you or your. Not, not every time, because in this case, it doesn't mean you or your, but it's part of a word. Koset, which is darkness, obscurity. And then she's going to tell you something about this word. But I'm saying, line up the phonetics to hear what she has to say. Oh, you have to hear talk to me that. But this has to be recorded. recorded. Oh, you can just hold it there. So, when Tim was teaching on Hosea, <laughs> all right, so we know that our sovereign king has given us choice. He gives us life or death, right? And then, so we get into conversation about all this information that we have, and it's a choice. You can either accept it or reject it. Then I was sitting there looking at Joseph, and, and, and it was just like, so. I got to drive here a little bit. I looked at that, and I'm going, ah, oh, so we have choice of life or death. But, do you see where I'm going with this? Choose. 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 And then, and then Eric brought in the you or or. You or or. Your. You or your. So, we have a choice, but then you can choose. And Hosef is darkness, it's that evil influence. It's, it's the everything to us that is blah, not good. So, right, Hosef, we can choose to stay in darkness. Or we can choose to be in his light. And then, if I take it a step more, if I do that one, what is that? Choose. Who? This is a play on words, I know, but I'm thinking, okay, he gives us choice, and then we can choose, and then we can be chosen. <coughs> Have you um, in five minutes yeah. <laughs> briefly show how the, how Yahweh makes provision for this um, makes provision for this darkness um, because it is a consequence for making wrong choices because we uh, the attacks that have come to us are um, how can I say um, you know we're we're saying that he didn't create that but he made provision for our choices to take us there because he gave us choice. Do you know what I'm talking about? Can you can you um, maybe expand on that? Because we didn't have a chance to do that, and I don't know. And put the mic down. Is it on? Yeah? Okay. Looks like it. Is the green so light on? We, we mentioned huh? the concept previously about this notion of a fractal pattern. Does anybody not know what I mean by that? Well, I guess not. <laughs> okay. 
you had some samples of leaves. Mm -hmm. Do you have in that collection a type of a leaf where if you look at the little piece of the leaf, it looks just like the bigger form of the whole leaf? Can you look through there and see? If not, I'll draw a picture of it. If you have a computer, you can generate this kind of an image. Well, kind of, kind of like that, but it, it's where, for example, say you take a leaf of a tree and you look at the veins in the leaf, and then you hold it up and look at the silhouette of the whole tree and realize it's the exact same pattern. Or computers have a way of doing this where they take a small little pattern and then they blow it up as part of another pattern. And as a matter of fact, there's a certain kind of uh, cauliflower. It's a spiral. Do you know which one I'm talking about? It's an incredible looking geometrical pattern. It has a certain name of a cauliflower. It, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Chinese cauliflower, yeah. Is it, is it with Chinese its, cauliflower? With spikes, like. It has spikes. Yeah. This is the perfect example of this. Do you find one? But let's see if that's what I'm talking about. Well, kind of. Here's the whole leaf. But each little barb looks like the whole leaf. And on each little barb is another little barb, which also looks like the whole leaf. And on that little barb is another little barb, which also looks like the whole leaf. You know what I mean? Mm. So if you ever get a chance, if you're walking through a vegetable place, if they happen to have, if it is Chinese cauliflower or whatever it is, there's a certain name for it. Thank you. They call it a tree of life. It's called a tree of life? Okay, well, the interesting thing is it's this beautiful uh, variegated green color. That's it. Pagoda cauliflower stock. If you could look at this and blow it up, this thing is incredible. The whole thing is the shape of a spiral, like a, a cone, but each cone has a bunch of other little cones, and each other little cone looks just like the whole plant, and on them, each one has another little thing, and each one is it's the same thing again and again. You can go smaller and smaller, and, and you, you can never get to the end of it. And it's just the same kind of imagery that I've... Sorry, who gave this to me? My mind is... Show that to others if you would. I mean, if anybody's interested. But what I'm saying, that's the way the scriptures work. So the pattern that you see... Let's, let's back up to the alphabet. The same pattern in the alphabet is the pattern of Mashiach, which is the pattern of yod vav Elohim, which is the pattern that he put into creation, which is the pattern that he put in humanity, which is the pattern that he put in the scriptures, which is the pattern that he put in the Garden of Eden, which is the pattern that he put in the plan of redemption. So what I'm saying is it's all this same pattern. And so when you, when you finally get it in one little piece of that pattern, you can take that and apply it everywhere else. But if you got the wrong pattern, 2 plus 2 equals 3, or 2 plus 2 equals 5, it's going to blow it when you assume that it's everything else. So one way to double check is that if the pattern works here, and it works in this other pattern, and it works in this larger pattern, then, then maybe you have the right one. But what if he designed it such that if you're wrong here, you'll see this whole construct, like, that's what I was saying. If 2 plus 2 equals 5, what does this whole thing look like? If 2 plus 2 equals 3, what does this whole thing look like? So it may not be that if you have the wrong pattern, it doesn't construct anything. Mm -hmm. You change the, the DNA, something will be constructed. For example, some friends got some seeds of a squash of, of a genetically modified plant. The next generation came out mutated, and the next generation wouldn't work at all. But the mutated next generation was horrible looking. <coughs> So much so that it, it was either a piece of art or an atrocity that you wouldn't want to eat. But when you buy the first generation in the store, it looks perfectly good, and you eat it as if it's perfectly okay. But the question is, what are you now ingesting? Mm -hmm. He put plants with seeds and said they should propagate, these are food for us, we should eat them. And if somebody destroys the seeds, destroys the DNA, even though the shell of the plant still looks okay, it doesn't have the life. So if you eat seedless watermelon, what are you actually getting? It's not the same nutrition because the true nutrition of the entire system is that the whole system works together. And therefore, if you destroy the food and you eat the food, you're now corrupting the system. So the reason why a lot of people I know look for non-GMO'd food 
It's not because they're being legally. It's so disparaging what you hear people say, the mocking, the scoffing, and the scorning, and, and just bad-mouthing because you want to do things Yah's way? What if that? But that's what we do to each other. But what I'm saying is the idea of going back to Hebrew is the same thing. Because the other languages, and they'll say, well, he did it. He invented the Babel, and he changed all the languages. Now, why would he do such a thing? Is that to say that if you speak Norwegian or African or Chinese, you're bad, you're wrong, you're less, you're, you're not human enough? I have nothing to do with that. I never said anything. But he's given us a path back. The interesting thing is that the word for <coughs> Lashon, as in the phrase Lashon Hara, which is the evil tongue, Lashon is Lamed, which means unto regarding Sheen Vav Nun. Well, this word Sheen Vav Nun is pretty similar to Sheen Yod Nun, which is Shin, which is teeth. So as your teeth are side by side variant, but lined up, so up and down they're variant, and they come against each other to chew and bite. <laughs> that same word means variant and to change, to be contrasting in opposition. And when it talks about the other languages, that's the word that's used. So after the Tower of Babel, the people were broken up and split apart according to their languages. And ever since then, the different people groups have been agitating and against each other. Is that a bad word? No, it's a descriptive word. It just tells you, okay, that's... And if you look at Shin and study the word, that's what that is. But the word for the Hebrew tongue, the Hebrew language, they use a different word. It's Shin, Pei, Hei. Shafa. This is, the, this, this is the P or the PH, which is the F sound. It's all the same letter. Shafa. That means lip. So when he says he will restore a clean lip, it's that word. But also, the lip is the smooth part. So the river bank where the foliage doesn't grow, that's also shafa. If you have a, a pottery cup and it's rather rough, they'll always make the smooth lip. Why? So you don't cut your lips open while you're drinking. You lose your hair, that's also a shafa. <laughs> where the wind blows and clear something away on top of a mountain, that's also Shafa. It also means restore to health, cure from lunacy. Mm -hmm. Now why would that be the case? So someone asked, well what's the real definition? Does it mean language? Does it mean bald? Or does it mean restore to health and cure from lunacy? Or does it mean language? Yes. So the way I look at it is, yes, it means all that. And it's particularly related to the Hebrew lip, the Hebrew tongue, the Hebrew language. So I choose to believe that by studying Hebrew, we are restored to health and cured from lunacy. To recover is also what it means. And I believe it's the same word that means after a funeral where you serve a meal, because people have ooh, the remorse, the... The, the crushing and you you serve a meal to invigorate them because the one who has passed, their job is over. Their struggles are ceased. They're slumbering until the awakening. But the rest of us got to get back to the task, put our feet back to the, to the walk and our hands to the, the grindstone, as it were. So that meal recovers us. That's what the Hebrew language does because it's the same exact word. So... As I look through definitions of words, I'm reading into it. And one can choose to not read into it very deep because they just want to get the surface level. A friend of a friend works for a strong concordance. And apparently he told my friend, he says, we know there's no possible way to give an accurate one word to one word translation definition. But we got to do something. We gotta give you something. So you get the word was or became. Why? So you can read the text. Because if you don't have the Bible, you're looking around, what's this place doing here? I don't know. What, what are those dots in the sky? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. 
You're like a diamond in the sky. But for centuries, nobody knew what those things were. Now we've got a Hubble telescope. We can take these pictures, and it's pretty astounding. We see the colors and this and that and the other thing. We know stuff, but in the past, they didn't. The same difference is having these words of Scripture. People in other cultures, they don't know what those stars are. They don't know how this planet got here. They don't know who El Elyon, the Most High, they have a concept of Most High, like Melchizedek. He referred to El Elyon. He didn't call him Yahuwah or Ehye. Why not? Did he not know? Did Melchizedek himself have a diminished understanding? Do we now have more access of reality and truth than even Melchizedek had? Yes. Because he didn't have any insight of Yahushua, the man that walked amongst us, nor did he have the Ruach HaKodesh poured out the way that Yeshua gave us, nor does he have the full scope of the scriptures. We are in a better position of understanding and being able to actively do the work of the kingdom than any other generation ever before. Because like I said, a hundred years ago, anybody that had these thoughts would have been put to death. How we even got this far is almost surprising. But here we are. And as you pointed out, we're at liberty to have this moed without any conflict. And to sit and think without anybody crowding in a little event happened, and I don't know why, but at Waco, Texas, a few years ago, these people were meeting to have the religious observance of what they thought was reality, and some stormtroopers came in with blaring music, blasting lights, tanks, and fire, and chemicals to destroy them. The blaring music was so that they couldn't think. The chemicals were to destroy their physical body and the contortions and spasms of cramping, that their bones were even breaking. That's what was done by certain people who didn't want them thinking outside the box. That was just a few years ago. That wasn't the Middle Ages. Just so you know what we're dealing with. Which is to say, thank you, Yahweh. Why are we now looking at Hebrew? To restore to health. Why? Daniel chapter 2. Okay, we'll get to that. But I just want to show you that why is it that people think that skulls and crossbones are so cool? There's something about it that, that, that's fascinating, enchanting. It's that inner nature. But ever since the beginning, why was it that the Nahash in the garden was able to tantalize Pua, then Adam, with the thought that, hey, there's this other thing. Why did they, why did they even start to look? Because Yahweh put within us as part of our psyche, as part of our nephesh, our, our being, curiosity, intriguing. Is that evil? No, he made us that way. And then he said, don't do it. Why? <laughs> choice. He gave us a choice. And if there wasn't anything to choose, he would have denied his choice. That, that we were talking about, you know, you give a beggar a, a coin and say, no, but don't spend it. No, you can spend it whatever you want. Your choice. I suggest you choose life. That's what Moshe said. I put before you life and death. And I urge you, please choose life. But if you don't, that's your call. I, I can't make you. I can't I can bend your arm until you choose life. All we can do is say, here's the words. Here's what Yahweh said. And, and each of us gets the choice. So why did Yahweh make the earth such as he did? Why this path? To give us a chance to choose. And therefore, if somebody says, I love the skull and crossbones. I love the black death. Okay, that's your choice. I find it intriguing. I, I find it kind of uh, mesmerizing. Or I, I have to choose no. Still interesting, but I have to choose no. Mm. I have to choose no and then turn my foot from it, even though. Oh, wait a minute. Who did that? Who turned their. Who walked and looked back? That's wife. We can't even do that. He gives us these stories by which we can model, conduct our behavior and say, if I go back to something I already turned away from, is he really going to turn me to stone? 
turned to a pillar of salt. Dare I? Wait a minute, why am I even doing that? Uh, human nature? Okay, that's a good excuse. And maybe it's even true. But we're not in, in bondage to or subject to human nature, but we're influenced by human nature. So my point is, if you have a thought to look back, that's not the sin. You didn't corrupt yourself unto hell. Even if you happen to, to look back and... There was this one guy, first started going to this church many years ago, and home church meetings. And I only went there a couple weeks, and this particular leader was greatly adored by the, by the people. And he says, hey, i got to quit. I, gotta, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. I've got, got to get on with my life. And everybody's like, oh, you meant so much to me. And everybody went around the room and complimenting the guy and saying how much he helped their life. And he's like, oh. I remember he said, boy, I, I, I don't want to hear anymore because uh, maybe it will diminish my rewards in heaven. You know, if you get rewarded now, then you won't have them there. And this, but everybody was saying, oh, gosh. He kind of disappeared. I don't know where he went. Nobody saw him for a couple years. And somebody said they saw him once on the street, and he was kind of all punked out, you know, going like he was back in the world. It's like, really? Him? And then I later heard a story about five years later that said he had just turned back. He had just turned back to the walking the way of truth and light. Amen. Car accident and killed. Did he turn back soon enough? Let's hope so. But there's a scripture that says, if the wicked man turns from his wickedness unto righteousness, none of his wickedness will be remembered. None of it. But if the righteous man turns from his righteousness and turns back to his wickedness, none of his righteousness will be remembered. You're left in your state. But that goes then, oh, well, what about the doctrine of once saved, always saved? But what about the doctrine of, it's like, I'm not talking doctrine. I don't know. You can make up your own rules if you want to. Go ask somebody else what they think about that. What do these words say? These words say, Okay, you work on houses, you climb up a ladder. You know, you might whoop, slip and jump off a, a couple rungs, but if you climb up uh, 10 or 30 rungs, you don't want to fall off. The, the higher, the farther along the path you go, turn back to what? Amen. It's tohu ve bohu. It's, it's vanity, emptiness, formless, void. Turn back? Why? Are you being hypnotized, tantalized, mesmerized, and... So that's why we help each other. It's like, you going back to that disco? Why? Well, it's fine. I like, I like the, well, you were saying, oh, Shabbat Shalom, just as well. You know? It's like, what does the disco offer? The only way to really appreciate the disco is to be a little bit drugged, a little bit drinking, a little bit partying, a little bit getting your eyes looking at those others. And it's like, really? And how, and what is that good for? A momentary high, but it's not the ways of life. I'm not putting down anybody who might have fun going someplace. But I'm just saying, when you're there, you're in it. You've got the mentality. But as soon as you step outside, it's like, we can see it for what it is. It's like, gosh, I can't go there anymore. I can't appreciate it anymore. So why look back? And I know some people who get bored with, here's the Christian life. You have to be good. It's worse than that. Some friends... It was back in, uh, back in Hollywood in L.A. And we you know, met at the church and this and that a few years later, got together again, and this one lady was saying, you know, quite candidly, God's kind of a dirty rat. He just doesn't do what he says. Makes all these promises. He's supposed to live this life. What we actually get is we're disappointed. We're, we're left kind of high and dry. Ooh, there's a great... Great life and the light and the life and all these wonderful words and you sing these songs and you go to church and you come home and it's like, okay. And the, the other guy that was sitting at the table was like, he had been a leader once. He had had a prison ministry and his wife ran off, how do you do this, ran off with one of the guys in jail. Who was the exact opposite. He was a, he was a scumbag, but he left him and the kids to go run off with how do you run off with a guy in a jail cell? 
But the point is, he even got to the point where he was disappointed he missed that life. He missed the nightlife. He missed being able to laugh at the jokes with the guys that, you know, working in the building and all. And he said, I'm going back in. Say, what? What are you doing? And I started to throttle him a bit, and he said, oh, I forgot you were that guy. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry I'm even sitting here at dinner with you. Like, okay, what, do you want to change the subject? Want to talk about sports? Okay, sure, let's talk about sports. He didn't want to hear it. Didn't want to be corrected. And if he doesn't turn around or didn't, I mean, it was years ago, it's like, gone. Really? You're going to forsake the kingdom of Elohim unto eternity so that you can laugh at some stupid joke? So that you can wiggle your butt to a tune? Really? Do you realize how precious this is? And if you're bored, start studying Hebrew. It, yeah. It's captivating. It's invigorating. It's life. But well, we need the alphabet to do that. Oh, so let me show you. <laughs> So again, I would encourage you if you if you could to write these down. The lights are off, but but just just to practice. So I'll write the letters a little bigger. Just just to practice drawing them. And just so you know, just so you know, this particular font I use. That's another part of the story, but it's, it's not what anybody else uses. Okay, so you go online, you will find other fonts, but not the one I use. However, a friend of mine, back in Oregon, made a very clean file of this font that I use, and you can get it from them and put it on your computer so that you can type with these letters if you want to, or make them any color and any size you want. It's called Pure Paleo. You get really pure and clean a vector file. And if you contact... Uh, well, here, this is who you contact. I'll just put it on here and then we'll get on this. You contact Lee at Paleo Sefer, S E P H E R dot com. Okay, that, that's actually a Paleo Sefer dot com is a website that he built to house this stuff. There's not a whole lot of stuff there because it's, we never, we're both so busy working it never gets developed. But if you contact Lee at Paleo Sefer dot com, he can send you the file of this Paleo Hebrew font. You can download, download it on your computer. It's key to the Israeli keyboard. So therefore, you can go to different sites. And I know so let's so little about the computers. It's like you push a couple buttons and all of a sudden you got it. You know, just, just push a couple buttons. But he can tell you how to do it. It's key to the Israeli keyboard, but he can show you what's being. Did you get it? Oh, sorry. No, I don't. Charlie, as soon as you lose. Right. Okay. The Israeli keyboard means that if you have a software program that is written in in Hebrew letters, those letters are encoded in the software behind the surface, and depending on the keyboard layout. So this one friend of mine put together what he called the uh, erectology font. And I, I drew the letters on a piece of paper. He photographed them, sent them into the guy, and they sent it back. But if you enlarge them, they're very scratchy. And I tried to get some work done at a print shop, and it was so scratchy it crashed the computer because there was too many edges. And it was not quite, it didn't, I didn't even like them. They were kind of unclean. At least one letter was that I hated. And my friend said, no, oh, we're going with that. It's like, come on, let me fix it up. It's like, yeah. Anyway, the point is, Lee cleaned it up really nice. And then by putting it to one keyboard, he then found if you, because the keyboard wasn't the Israeli keyboard, if you try to plug in the letters from some other piece of software, the, the letters are different. So he got the Israeli keyboard and keyed it to that. So that's getting into a realm that I'm not so up to speed on, but just to say he is. And so he... He won't just send it to you, but he'll kind of help walk you through it. Yeah, just contact me at Paleo Sefer, and he'll send it to you. And, but he wants some feedback, just because if you find an error, you see, you don't know if it's an error if you don't read the language, which is why we need to share the alphabet. Because I have seen, just so you know, I have seen 
in printed material that the letter was supposed to be a Dalit in modern Hebrew, but they printed it as a resh. Yeah. That the letter was supposed to be a bet, and they printed it as a cough. And it was supposed to be a hay, and they printed it as a hat. And if you didn't know the difference, and you just believed the printed material, you'll be led astray, and you didn't know it. And they didn't do it on purpose. And besides that, gosh, so many times, like when I was making that chart, I was at the printer at least 100 different times. <clears throat> And many times, I sat there, and they printed something in. I said, okay, let's double check it after hours of sitting there. And prints up, and the computer says, and changes it. And I had to sit there and look through word by word by word by word. Every single time, there was always something that kept changing. The computer will just do it to you. And if you guys don't know how to scrutinize, you'll be autocorrect. Besides the auto, I don't know how to do that. I wish I did. Oh, gosh. You take your phone and throw it at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Besides autocorrect, which is correcting English spelling, there's this other thing. Like, for example, I'll show you how to correct exactly with this. Okay, I was just writing up this 150 page thing, which I'm almost done. I've got like four other pages of an index to add, and then I was going to email. So, anybody wants it, give my wife your email, and when I get this thing done, when I get back, I'll send it to you for what it's for whatever value that is. But it's like 150 pages of stuff I just was working and writing. But to take a Hebrew word, I have to take my English words and write a three-letter code key to the Israeli keyword. Where I think, I think F is the letter tat and J is the letter tat. A might be Aleph and B might be Bet, but some of the letters are weird. So if I write in these three letters of a three-letter word, the computer says, oh, what, what you really mean is and some English word that I recognize. It's like, no, that's not what I mean. And I hit no, and I go back, and I do that three or four times, and finally it'll let me have it. And then I look back later, and it's, oh, what? It changed it again. <laughs> so then I have to print the thing up and have the real Hebrew letters come back and, and double check it again and again and again. And then my, my computer goes to, to Lee's, and, and Lee's changes it, and then he sends it back to this other lady, Marina, and it changes it again, and I have to scrutinize it, and it's like, why is it? But just to say, anything I end up with to just to, to, to give people has been gone over so many times, it's not so easy, so there might be a mistake. I'm just saying, there might be a mistake, and I'm trying to be so careful, but then you get other publications, I'm not pointing at these, but I'm saying you, you see a book table of other publications, and I've noticed many mistakes in Hebrew writing of publications from other people because what? Uh, somebody doesn't know or the computer goofed up or the, the guy at the printer goofed up. In fact, these one friends, they were putting on a conference and in the background they had some Hebrew writing. This was about five years ago. And so I, and I looked at, I said, oh, I wonder what word that is. It's kind of, you know, the background, the backdrop of the Hebrew writing. And what the word is, this stuff is garbage to be thrown in the can. I thought, what? I thought, now why in the world would they write that? And I called them up to say, do you know what's printed on your flyer? And they said, no, we think it means that. And I realized, oh, it's printed backwards. Because the guy that they hired printed it backwards. Instead of saying Aleph Tav, it said Tav Aleph. He doesn't know. He doesn't care. He doesn't speak Hebrew. And I thought maybe it was uh, some subterfuge by some... Hebrew-speaking Jewish guy that's saying, I'm going to tell anybody that knows Hebrew, stay away from these people, it's a bunch of stuff. Don't pay any attention and listen to them. Was this an undermining sabotage? I don't know. I don't know who they had. But they printed it because they don't know. It's like, oh, let's have some Hebrew stuff. <sighs> of all things to have written, too. <laughs> Just to say, you know, we got to be careful because we're playing with fire. But it may not have been undermined by anybody human. That's right. It might, that's right. It might have been a spiritual dimension thing. Playing with fire. That, that brings something else to mind here. Avi ben Mordecai wrote a book. He's a guy who goes around and speaks, right? He wrote a number of books. One about Galatians, which is a fabulous book of insight. Another one was Messiah 1, 2, and 3. Three different books. And... I don't even think they're in print anymore, but Messiah 3 was talking about the, some Kabbalistic stuff. But he says, listen, there's some good Kabbalah and there's bad Kabbalah. I don't know, I haven't studied it, just so you know. But he was saying there's some good and bad. But he says they have this concept of white fire and black fire. What does that mean? Now, I'm not going to preach Kabbalah. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I'm trying to tell you there's this concept 
that these other people have. That black fire, this is my understanding, the black fire are these fiery letters of the Torah. Because it says when he wrote with his finger on tables of stone, it was a fiery Torah. There's another way to read that word. But if you look at the movie called The Ten Commandments, Moshe is standing there and you've got this rock and this big fire and burns the letters of fire. So this is this Jewish concept that it, the letters were fire. But when you write them, you use black ink and they have these little flourishes of, uh, you know, on the top of each letter you have this flame sort of thing, right? That, that, this little flame. So that's like, they call them these flame letters. Well, what's the white fire? But he says, well, that's, that's the letters that are in between the letters, or that's how to read in between the letters. Kind of like we talk about reading in between the lines. Mm -hmm. I can't even understand the letters, much less reading between the letters. Gosh. What does that mean? The vowel points. Well, it might be the vowel points, because that's where that vowels go in between the consonants. That's one way that that, that might be. But, but there was this concept of reading between the letters. What does that mean? Reading between the letters. Now, and this is all part of the alphabet, by the way, what I'm going to show you right here, <laughs> is that I went to, uh, I, I took some studies in film animation. And the way you, if you're going to, if you're going to do a, if you know what a flip book is, yeah. you draw pictures incrementally different, right? And you go, yeah. and as you look at it, they move. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was thinking, what if the alphabet was a flip book? How would, how would it look? So if you have Aleph, and then you have Bet, and then you have Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Bob, Zion. First seven letters. So here, I'll give you the modern Hebrew. So you can, you can write them down if you want, just to practice. Aleph. That the bet may or may not have a dot in the middle. Either way, two different vowel sounds, a B or a B. Anyway, Gimel. I'm kind of exaggerating these a little bit. A lot of them you won't see this exaggerated. It's almost hard to read, but that's another story. Dalit. Hey. Vav. Right. So here's here's the thought. If those are the black letters, what are the white letters? How do you read in between the letters? What does that mean? Well, if this was a flip book, this position would, would become this, and this would become this, and this would become this, so forth. And then if you read them real fast, this ends up over here. So if I'm, if I'm going to walk, I'll draw this picture, and then I'll draw this picture, and then that picture, and then that picture, and then that picture, and then that one, and then that one, and then that one. Put them all together, and that's where you end up with film. I mean, video is the same thing. Yeah. And it moves, right? So, as a concept, what happens? If I'm just saying this is a, this, and this is literally what it means, just, just for what I want right here. This is ox, house, camel, door, window, nail, and weapon. Now, let me suggest that's a story. And it, as a flip book, we just read the story. These are just the main staging. Now, it's the in-between, right? If you're filming, there's one way to film animation where it's five frames per second. So you hold this for five frames, then that one for five frames, then that one for five frames. But you'll see some bad animation where real jerky. That's what they do. But if I film this three frames, three frames, three frames, it's smoother. Live action film is every one of them is a different frame. So that's where you get, you know, perfectly fluid action. Okay? But, so it's the in-betweens. If these are the, the fluidity of thought is how many in-betweens are in-between to these statements. Now, the reason I'm explaining that to you is because essentially those are the white letters. But nobody tells us what these white letters are. So I am now, non-scripturally, trying to show you just thinking. We're thinking about Yahweh's stuff, using other stuff in life, film work, to look at his alphabet and say, what does this mean? 
So, what does it take for Aleph to get to Beth? If I'm showing you this position and that position, I move my arm and my leg. That's what I'm doing. Okay. But what is it, as a concept, what did Aleph do to become Beth? Remember what we said Aleph was? What? An ox, sure, and Beth's a house, right? Okay, but let's get out of, let's get out of those pictures. What else is Aleph? The infinite. The infinite. And what's Beth? The house. The house, which is finite. Okay, what had to happen for the infinite to become finite? Well, the gate. Or go through a door. It had to go through some kind of a door, but a fence or a door is a place of transition. So what you're saying is that something transitioned, but what? Based on what we were talking about the other day, th think about it for a minute. This isn't a trick question. We're just now we're contemplating how the alphabet works. And I'm not going to go through this with every letter, though we could, though that chart does. That's another story. But I, I'm, not, I'm just going to show you a couple letters for these first seven because after all, seven is what some people call the perfect number, God's number, the number of heaven. The no Why do they call that that number? That's another story. But these are the first seven letters. So I'll show you closely here, a little bit more there, and then I'll show you the rest of the alphabet. Because I'm showing you a principle which can be applied. So what has to happen for the infinite to become finite? Anybody want to throw out it? No. What do these in-betweens look like? Well, you have to take on a body. Okay, something without a body has to take on a body, which means he has to invent a body, design it, and figure out now how he's going to get in it. It's no different than you saying, it's cold outside. What do I do? I should wear a coat. I don't have a coat. I need to make a coat. Gee, why don't I get some plants and weave them, or kill an animal and get dressed up in his skin, like Adam and Hood did, right? You have to take the idea and do something to make it concrete. If you're a designer and you want to build a house, you figure out the plan, or even if you go get a cardboard box and you crawl into it, now you're in a house. Okay? So that's what happened between Aleph and Beth. So in order to do that, the idea of Aleph had to systematize, organize, and place in sequential order what it was going to do. You understand that? Okay, what did Bet have to do to become Gimel? Well, Gimel's a camel. Well, this is a house and that's an ox. So what has this got to do with an ox and a house? Kind of nothing. But we could take on another frame of mind, which is a different conversation, which we're not going to have, and now we're going to try to figure out what does the ox have to do with the house. But for now, we're not going to go there. But that's what I'm saying. Tim can tell you something, I can tell you something, other books can tell you something, which one's right or wrong, maybe all of them, maybe all of them. Maybe there's some false information in there, but I'm just trying to show you how to think. And remember, if your thinking processes are an extension of this alphabet, as the same way this cosmos is an extension of the alphabet, then for us to think, we think like the alphabet. So I'm... I'm, I'm showing you how to exercise the alphabet simply by thinking. It's kind of like the fractal pattern of that cauliflower, right? Us thinking about the alphabet is doing the alphabet because we can only think according to a certain way. Yes? Are you talking about conceptual Well, I think I'm talking about conceptual thinking. What do you mean by that, exactly? Well, you're teaching us like we're learning in concepts. Yes. Okay, each one of these letters is a concept. They're not just a letter of phonics. So that's what I'm trying to show you. And then I'm trying to show you that necessarily this bet extends from the out. Because if, if you start anything, I have an idea. So what are you going to do about it? Let's implement the idea. Let's make it tangible. Let's bet. So the finite one, see, before he created the world, what did he do? What did, let's say this was the first world he made. You have to think about it. He had to think about it. He's the infinite one without time. How many years did it take him thinking about it before he finally said Yehi Or and caused it to be? Before Elohim bara Hashemayim? Did he just say, hey, you know, I'd like to make some heavens. Boom, oh, hey, there it is. Guess what? Hey, look at it, it all worked. Did he do that? Did he surprise even himself? Or did he say, 
You know, I'd like to make a... I'd like to make something. Heavens and earth. What are they going to look like? How big are they going to be? How does this work? Did he sit there and design all the mathematics and the chemistry and all the everything of animals and plants and then, poof, make it happen? In which case, there's a lot of stuff going on. And how many years? Well, he doesn't register time. Eons before he ever made the begotten one. What did he do by himself? Twiddle his thumbs? I mean, what did he do for... What did he do before he started twiddling his thumbs? For, for the forever. It's like our minds can't go there. Why? Because our minds are trapped with starting at Aleph. We're trapped in this container of Aleph to Tav. So we can't even imagine what's on the other side of Aleph because we have to start with Aleph. So all we can do, like I showed the arrow, we can imagine a little bit, well, there's some, something before this existing, but he didn't design our brains with the capacity. You know why? Because he designed it that way on purpose. It could have been otherwise, but it isn't because that's what he made. So what I'm saying is that I'm trying to show you a little picture of all the thoughts that I have put into <coughs> contemplating this alphabet. And it might sound like a little scatterbrained or a little bit weird or a little bit, why is he going on and on? And it's like, hey, listen, I've given you about 15 minutes right now of what was 15,000 hours <laughs> of trying to figure out how this works. I'm not trying to confuse you, I'm just trying to give you a taste of what it means to study the alphabet, or, or look at the dictionary, or look at Hebrew. Just, just a little taste. So the infinite one had to decide how to make things finite, and then he said that he barad the heavens and the earth. Now, what's Gimel? Well, Gimel's a camel. But... So I showed you how Aleph looked like the ox head, right? You know, the, the horns and the, the ears and the eyes and the nose, you know. It's kind of an ox head shape. And this is kind of the uh, embryo or the tadpole, you know, you got the eye. And... This is actually like a boomerang shape. But it's also the head of a camel. So he's got these feet and the hump on his back. But it's just showing you the camel's head and neck. Something gets carried out. What gets carried out? The process of the <laughs> Okay, now listen, listen to what he said there. It gets carried. Now to carry out something means I have to pick this up and move it. I'm transporting it. And that's why that's the camel. Yeah. That's what a camel does. Yeah. That's what a truck does. What does the bet do? That is a house. It's a container. It just sits there. So I can say bet is actually a noun, aleph is an idea, and gimel is the verb. It's the noun in motion. Yeah. Now if all of a sudden I take a wind-up car and I set it here, that's, that's me taking the bet and winding it up, and now I let it go so it's gimeling. Where's it going to go? out the door or bump into something and it's like, why? It's going to hit like so <laughs> now why would it do that? Because everything does. <laughs> 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 like, uh, yeah. it, once you send something in motion, it needs direction, right? The yeah. direction is either keep going or stop or turn right or left. So what's direction? Hey, guess what? The next letter happens to be Dalit, which is the door, which is a choice. <laughs> which equals direction. So there's, do you see what the natural flow is starting to happen? It's like, as soon as you have an idea, what do you do? You, you put it into form. And then you take the object and set it into motion. You get, you, you make a, an earth and a sun and then you send one around the other. But once something's moving, it's like if you make a car with an engine and you don't give it any brakes, now you're <laughs> in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> Reminds me of an article I saw in a, went, went to some store where they're selling parts and all, and they had this article. A guy had got a hold of a jet engine uh, igniter type of a thing. It would, they used to start up jet engines. And he, and he tied it, clamped it somehow, bolted it to his Nova, and went out in the desert. 
and they could see where he hit the brakes. There was a skid mark, and they found him stuck into the mountain. They found some tea. Oh, it's like, uh, oops. Uh, I don't think a seatbelt would have done any good. <laughs> the guy didn't quite think far enough ahead. You know, I mean, how do you stop a jet engine with a, some friction brakes on some wheels that are not even any longer on the ground? Or, in other words, he, uh, his idea wasn't thought through quite well enough. Wrong choice. <laughs> <Wrong voice. laughs> I missed the door. He went through the wrong door. <laughs> okay, so that actually is what hay's all about. Hay is a suggestion of how to choose the right door. That's exactly what hay is. Because hay means the, like, I put before you life and death, I suggest you choose life. Don't well, start that in. <laughs> That's hay. And you say, okay, now I've made my decision and I'm attached to it, I'm locked on. So this fob is a nail, which is to attach, which is to commit, which is to, to make the choice going through the suggestion and actually going there. And then Zion literally is a weapon, which basically means to be cut off, which is to say the, the choice is, what, what's the word, uh, to be validated or when you, um, when something's done, when they, uh, when, when, when they take a bill, it's ratified. Like if I could build right through Congress, it's like, okay, done. Done. It's, it's, you're committed. Yeah, sure, it is finished. Same concept. Okay, so you're locked in. Once that guy lit that thing up, he had made his choice, and he was not going to stop just because his foot hit the brakes. It's like, no. Huh? Well, he got nailed because he, uh... <laughs> That's right. Okay, there's a pattern in everything. That, that's why I'm trying to show you. The thing, this, this goes even deeper and deeper. But here's, here's the point. So let me show you this. This is day one when he said, let there be light. Like, you know, like, you have somebody with this uh, light bulb going off above their... Head right, like, oh, hey, I got this great idea. Put a jet engine on my car. Yeah. <clears throat> so, that is remember, he separated water with a firmament from other water, but that's like the he's formulating something about substance. And the interesting thing about I talk about, about the physics is that you have. Electrons and protons that are separated, but they also, the, the electrons have a repulsion to each other, but they also have this attraction. So it's electromagnetic energy of plus and minus. And it's kind of been wrapped up in this picture. The other interesting thing about this is that he put water above and water below, separated by a firmament. It was all about water that day, too. The way you spell water in Hebrew is mem, yod, mem. But the letter mem is water, and the letter yod is something that's worked by your hand and flattened out, and the mem is water. So what you have is that a separation of water by water by a firmament <coughs> is the spelling of the word water in Hebrew. You see what I'm saying? Water separated from water with a, with a handwork firmament is the word water. And that's what he made on day two. So it tells me that that was on purpose, that the spelling of the word mayim for water has something to do with the way he designed the physics of what is a photon, what is a wave, it gets on the, all this other thing that we're not going to get into. But what I'm saying is that this has, that's not a mistake, that's not an accident, that's, a, that's incredible. That what he did on day two is the way you spell the word minor. Okay, on day three, he put plant life, essentially, plant life. So in other words, 
He could have put life in the water, but what he did is he separated water from earth, and then he put plant life. When I said he spoke plant life into the soil, because in Genesis 2, that's a whole other subject, but he says the plants hadn't sprouted yet. So sometimes you see pictures of where people say, well, on day two, you see this lush garden. But in Genesis 2, the plants hadn't sprouted yet because there was no rain and there's no man to water. Okay, so at least he planted seeds in the soil. So planting seeds in the soil is a theme of plant life. And remember, Gimel carrying something out is back and forth, right? What do seeds do? They propagate the genesis, the generations. They generate life. Door to door is generation after generation. So there's something about this boomerang, this boomerang action of carrying forward, of going back, of going forward, going back. There's this action. So Gimel is about an action. And when you see this, it, it's going out and it's coming back. And it's growing up and then teaching the young. And it's teaching and learning. And, there's, and I'm saying this for a reason. It gets into Daniel 12, which we're not going to get to right now. But the, you have to remind me to talk about that later. But I'm showing you that this Gimel is an action. It's not just the idea of a verb. And then day four is he put the, he lit up the, the, the greater light, and we'll say the, the lesser light, right? The sun, moon, and stars. And day five was the, the birds in the sky and the, the fish underneath the water. And day six was uh, animals and man. And day seven is Shabbat. I'm not going to go through this in great detail because we're running out of time. But what I'm saying is, look what's happening here. Fish and the birds, what does that got to do with the suggestion? Life and death? Fish are down there and birds up there? It's a metaphorical picture of heaven and hell. Life or death, heaven or hell. Life or death, make your choice. I suggest you live, and then you attach. What is man's job? As priests, man takes the affairs of 130 or 30? 30. 30. Man takes the affairs of heaven and the concerns of earth, and the Kohen, the man's job is to pull them together. So what are the prayers of your heart? You see what's going on on earth around you, and you invoke his attention. Man is this connector between heaven and earth. And the ones who are into death, they could care less, they're just going around causing trouble. And those who care, petition, intercede. The animals don't do it. Man does it. Man's job is that bob. Shabbat is cut off. Okay. Here's a certain theme. It's tied to these other things. Now let me show you one other level, level of what's going on here. And when I'm saying what's going on in between, I've, I've, I've tried to show you that the in-betweens are that these are staging. But if I just say ox, house, camel, door, window, nail, weapon, could you see the story? Not so easy. Now here, let me show you another level of the story. I don't, know, I don't know if these colors are no good for you, but anyway. There's a word that's spelled Aleph Bet. Ah, you know what it means? Father. Strength of the ox. You could say Aleph is strong, like an ox, and Bet is a house. So it's the strength of the house. Now, this book here by Frank Seagulls. That's what this book is about. Simple. Aleph is strong like an ox. Ben is a house, so therefore Av, the father, is the strength of the house. And he does that with all the letters. However, He means to suggest or to express or like a window or a light. So the word spelled Aleph Bet He literally means to desire or to refuse energetically, to want passionately or to resist. Well, the father's job, you could say, is to allow things in or to keep things out of the house. The father's job it is to say ultimately yes or no. But the father is the one who had the desire to have a family and to build a house. That's the father's desire. So it's not just the human father's desire. It's, oh, Yahweh's 
desire. He also becomes a gate. <coughs> Excuse me? He also becomes a gate. So each one of these letters, you can read these deeper and deeper and deeper. And the more you study, the more you see, the more, aha, notions of, oh, I, I see now. Anyway. So Ab is father, or to have this desire. Bet Gimel is beg, where we get a beggar, which is somebody who's in need. Gimel Dalet is the word for God, or, or Gad, or the for fortune and luck. So you could say, is it fortunate for the one who's in need that the father's desire is to put himself himself into material form to come and give to the poor one the way to connect back through the door to the father's house, the one who has been cut off and lost. There's different ways you can read this, but I'm just trying to show you a suggestion. And here's another. If you look at these three letters, Bet Dimul Dalit, Baged, it literally means to deceive or betray. So I'm saying that if the Aleph, as I said the other day, as a prefix letter, means I am or I will. Well, who's it talking about? If I say I am, it's talking about me. And I just use the language for my own communication. So I am going to sit here. Okay. I would, I would maybe start that word with the letter Aleph. But if this Aleph bet is, is the signature, is the autograph, is the hologram written in his own hand of the author of the alphabet, if he starts off with a letter that means I am, who's that Aleph really referring to? The creators of the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> so if the Aleph is the silent letter, it represents the infinite, eternal, one whose voice we can't hear, creator of the heavens and the earth. And then this Aleph that becomes his bet, the container of what he wants to communicate about himself. So that when I read, read that bet means to be put into form, into a body, into a house, I can say that because the letter means I am, or I will, embody. I am will embody what? Something else or myself? He who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, who made the cosmos, the material matter of creation, why would he put himself into creation matter? Well, there's this concept that he says... Heaven is his earth, heaven is his throne, and earth is his footstool. So I thought, well, I want to look up that word for footstool. I wonder what it is. And then I looked, okay, this is the word, I forget what it is offhand, but this is the word translated footstool. Okay, what does that mean? And it says, well, a footstool is a place to put your foot. Oh, okay, now, so, so when somebody says, earth is his footstool, the first image that comes to my mind is that he's sitting on a throne, and as an ottoman, he sticks the earth. And he puts his feet upon the earth. There's another place where he talks about making your enemies your footstool, right? Different context. But you think, okay, well, he's kicked back on his throne, and he puts his feet upon the footstool. It's like, wait a minute. He's the dis disembodied one. He doesn't have a foot to put on the footstool. How can he put his feet on a footstool if he doesn't have a foot? So what's the first thing he makes? I will make myself a foot. <laughs> you can read it that way. Gimel is a letter with a foot. Even the Jews will tell you that. Remember I told you the other day, Gimel yeah. is the letter that has. So it's running. It's the letter with a foot. So it runs to give to Dalit, the poor one, because <clears throat> Dalal means poor, and he's got his hand back to receive. They'll tell you that. But they won't tell you that the Almighty, Infinite One, would be the guy who would run down to give to the poor one. Because... Some people think that he would never do that. Why would the infinite, immaterial one put himself into a finite enclosure of material matter? Why would he do that? Oh, the alphabet tells you. This word, Ab, well, it does mean father, but it means, remember, the one who has a desire. Because he felt like it. <laughs> it just felt like doing it. Are we going to hold that back for him? No. I felt like making myself a foot so I'd have a place to put my feet. Well, where would he put his feet? On the ottoman? On the earth. 
I'm pointing to a door, and I, and I call that the Earth. I point, I point to the triangle, and we all know it's a sphere, or maybe flat, or whatever. The point is, <laughs> it's symbolic imagery, right? So yeah. the sacrum, the sacral, the top half of the hourglass, what's, what's a door got to do with anything? Well, how does anybody, why did he create the heavens and the Earth? Because he wants to populate not the earth necessarily, though he did, but earth is a staging ground to see who gets to populate the infinite realm beyond the earth. Earth is a place of choosing. Earth, he's going to make 15 billion souls so far. They say there's 7 plus billion alive now. That's an equal number that all that have ever tread the earth. So we could say there's been about at least 15 billion souls. And earth is the place where they all get to choose whether they want to be part of his kingdom or not. And how many have chosen? I don't know. But that's what this earth is. It's a staging ground. It's a, it's a path. It's a gauntlet. It's a course to run. It's a womb to bring birth. It's that too. Now here, let me show you an interesting thing. There was the talk about the difference that Karen mentioned between Adama, which is land and soil, and earth. Now, why would he call it earth? This is a little bit of a tangent off this subject, but just to show you something about Hebrew. Aretz is earth. Aleph, Resh, Zadi. Aretz. Now, we spell it, again, going from right to left, E-A-R, and then this is T-Z. Aretz, but T-Z actually is sometimes twisted to become T-H. Earth. But if you read it backwards, because remember Greek was the inverse of Hebrew, what you get is T-R-A, which is terra, as in terra firma, as in terracotta, as in territory, terrestrial. It's all Hebrew. It's earth. But why would he call it that way? Why would he call it a retz? Retz. Remember A is like the, the aleph, which is like I am or I will? I will what? Rats. 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 I will rats. Why do they call them rats? Because they run. They run like rats. You go look up this word in the dictionary, resh-zadi, it means the runner of the course. Like a courier, like a mailman on a route. Or a quarter-mile quarter sprinter runs a quarter-mile course. It's the course that I will run. Well, who will run? Well, we all will run because we're stuck here to, to run this course and make a decision what we'll choose. But it starts with the Aleph, which means I will run. I will run? How can you run without a foot? So the first thing he does is make himself a foot to run this course on the earth. Hey, that's the Vav, man! Yeshua, who became the Vav, man, the Vav, the human, number six, the sixth letter, six is the number of man, to come down and run the same course that he stuck us here to run. Wow. With the same limitations and fallibilities and psychological geo. Why is that so interesting? I'm not going to do that. The same struggles we go through, he went through, to run the same course. Not as the superhero God-man with superhero powers, but as one of us. With all our feeble, fallible oh, limitations, hardships, and handicaps, and encumbrances. And he took them all to say, it's doable, if you regard the Torah. <laughs> That's an arrest. So for me to study each word, and then I could break down the Rash and Zadi, which is further down the alphabetic sequence. But I'm saying that as you start studying these words, you see these things, which to me are thrilling. Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm saying if you're if you're bored with going to church and seeing the Psalms, it's like, well, I'll start studying Hebrew because it goes deeper and deeper, and then this word combines with that word and that one to that one, and it's multidimensional because I'm just trying to show you a couple things on the surface. Then you see, and this is something I mentioned yesterday, that why didn't them crazy Jews recognize their own Messiah? I'll show you why. Because you have the bat the dalit to this word baged. And it means, literally, in the dictionary, it means to deceive, to betray, to act treacherously. And someone might say, well, that can't be right, because Yahweh would never do that. He's truth. He's light. When do you deceive and betray? In the darkness, in the whole sack. Sneaky. Dirty rat. Why would he do that? It also means camouflage. 
It means to appear in a form other than you really are so that you can sneak around without getting busted for it. So he came down looking like, hey, a human being. He put himself in disguise looking like a human being to show human beings the door back to the Father's house. So if he came in disguise, can we fault the Jews for not recognizing him? No. After all, didn't Yeshua himself say, hey, I've been hanging around with you guys for a few years now. Uh, who do people say I am? Some people think you're John. Some people think you're Elijah. Some people you think you're Joe Blow or the carpenter's son. Who do you guys think I am? Uh, Peter says, oh, I know. You are the son of God. And he says to Peter, who told you that? He's, he's, he's checking out his, his camouflage suit. Did, is the tag showing? <laughs> My camouflage suit is so good that you don't figure that out on your own. You could not, even though you've been with me and I've spoken to you and I've revealed things to you, you could not have figured that out on your own. The Ruach must have ratted on me, whispered in your ear and told you. So if Peter shouldn't have been able to figure it out, how can we blame any Jew for not recognizing him? It's not right. We're wrong for doing so. There is no blame. And anybody that doesn't know the truth of this, even today there's no blame for not being able to recognize him. Because the only way to recognize him is the guy that embodies these 22 letters. Really? And we've never been taught these 22 letters. He's the, so, he's the giver of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. He gives wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And then you take those English words and you put them into Hebrew and you look at the way you spell those words and the whole thing just... <sighs> it erupts like this rose that just keeps putting out layer of petals after petals after petals. Or like rows of shark's teeth after rows of shark's teeth that keep coming more and more. That's the way this Hebrew language opens. You want to move into my house? <laughs> Watch the videos. I can have a primer. <laughs> okay. So if he puts himself into the camouflage form of a man, what's this letter? The interesting thing is the word uh, is the letter Zion. Zion. It means weapon or cut off. Have you ever have you ever seen a TV show or whatever it is or heard of Zena, the warrior princess? Zena. It's the same word. When you put the hey at the end of a word, even though it's yod hey vav hey, the masculine father, if you put the hey at the end of a word, it puts it into the feminine suffix, the feminine form, which is to express or to reveal. So zina is simply Zion with a hey. Zina, the warrior princess, right? So zina is, is weapons, or to, it can mean to be adorned with weapons. So zina's outfit was not, you know, a nice dress with lace and, and high heels. She's got these boots and these spikes and these weapons and all these gadgets that he can... She can it's, she's adorned with weapons. She is, a weapon. she is a weapon. Zion means to be adorned with weapons. What do you, how do you tell the difference between an officer and an enlisted man? How, how might you tell? Okay, he might be decorated with fancy stuff. He might be wearing a special hat, maybe a bigger weapon, or he might even have a ceremonial sword, right? He may not use the ceremonial sword in battle, but he carries a sword. Hey, look it, I'm a big shot. I got me a sword. Okay, because the sword means you're a big shot. To be adorned with weapons means you're a big shot. So what this is saying is this man will be distinguished by weapons. Or he will be just simply distinguished. So this letter Zion is kind of like if you put an officer's hat, that's a distinguishing. If you're painting in a Renaissance painting and you paint a halo around somebody's head, what it means is, oh, this is the saint. And so then they had different categories of halos, some round, some square, some triangular, to designate which one is the high saint or the lower saint. But you, you specialize something around somebody's head, like a crown, like an officer's hat, to say, no, this is the big shot. So this man would have a ornamentation around his head of a weapon, like a crown of thorns. And he had, he was ornamented with weapons. As a matter of fact, Pilate said, oh, you're the king of the Jews, are you? Let me show you the king of Rome. And he took weapons. And he ornamented his body with the weapons of Rome. Oh, instead of just sticking a sword at his side, he stabbed a spear into his side. And instead of handing him a big tool, 
He tied them down and lashed his back with the big tool. So the other way of making a letter Zion in Hebrew, you'll see sometimes this, or this, or sometimes this. It's a Roman flail with spikes that they used on this man's back. Put a crown of thorns on his head and then put a robe around him and said, Behold your king. But he also, Pilate, said one other thing. He said, Behold the man. Behold the man. In English, in Latin, it's ecce homo. Behold the man, ecce homo. What would he have said in Hebrew? He may, behold. Ish, man. Aleph Tov, this. Or the word Zion He means this. Or Zion Aleph Tov means this. This letter Zion means to specify specifically. He means the, but Zion is in particular this man. So we were told he'd come as this man. This man adorned with the weapons. Well, how do I know this has anything to do with Yeshua? Because when Pilate said, after taking this man, and he says, Hine, it, Ishu, Ish is man, with the Vav suffix meaning it. Look what he did to it, your king. Ishu, I think that's where Yeshu comes from. Not Zeus, necessarily, but Ishu, this man. Hine, hey, behold, look. What we did to this man by our weapons. Hey, Vav Zion. And who was this Hey Vav Zion? The one who was the Aleph, who because of the Av of the Father, the, the desire, he put himself into disguise, Bet Gimel Dalit, diminishing his grandeur, Dal, to become impoverished, weakened, taking away his aloof strength and becoming mortal, subject to our weapons. To show us the door, he came and was put to that weapon when, when Pilate said, Behold this man. He was declaring, as it were, a fulfillment of prophecy that this Habob Zion is this very Bet Gimel Dalit ripping off the camouflage suit of this Ab of the Aleph. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh. Seven is a sworn vow. Shavah, Shin Bet Ayin, means to fill to the full, full capacity. Pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing, surfeited, abounding. He filled to the full the vow that I will run this course, Aleph, through Zion. Our letter G is a picture of a, it's the same thing, it's discs, it's a plowshare. He submitted his body to be ripped open by the Roman plowshare, the way you'd rip open the earth. And it was saying, standing there, I'm this guy. I am this guy. He has to be that Messiah. And then, the next letter, Chet is a fence. It's an enclosure. He was put into the tomb. Chet is a round thing. The round stone was rolled in front. Yod is a hand that holds, that grabs. The seal was put on it. The first ten letters all are a picture of him coming, dying, and being put into the tomb. The word spelled Chet Tet in the dictionary, or Chet Tet Aleph. Aleph just puts it into the form of a noun in the Aramaic format. It means sin. When you put a Yod at the end, it means my sin. It also means to be cleansed. It means to incur guilt. It means to offer a sin offering. It also means to find favor. So this one did this because of my sin. He incurred my guilt so that I could be cleansed, so that I could find favor. And he did this all for you. Cough. This all for you. Kaf Lamed, all of it, Yod Kaf Lamed means to have the power and capacity to prevail. He did this, we having the power and capacity to prevail, to impart to us the power and capacity to prevail, 
Because when you have a sacrifice, you take your guilt, your sin, your corruption, and it's imputed onto the sacrificial animal. And the cleanliness, which is why the sacrificial animal had to be pure without spot or wrinkle, the cleanliness of the sacrificial animal, the innocence of the sacrificial animal, is imputed to the one offering the sacrifice. So the model of what's happening in the sacrificial system is that I, admitting my guilt, dump it on this animal that doesn't deserve it. This animal takes it and dumps its innocent onto me, and then it's consumed. That's what happens. For what it's worth, the next letter, M. If you put your hand to keeping Kaf Lamed, lining up with Torah, the instructions of his, the instructions of his hand offering us life, then we can contain it all. That's what it says. Yod Kaf Lamed, to contain it all. But if we don't put our hand to doing all that he said, what we're left with is Kaf Lamed Mem, which is where we get the word Kalam. Calamity. C-A-L-M. Calm. Everything stops. And it also means to be put to shame and disgrace. But he also was put to shame and disgrace. He was put to shame and disgrace. So even Kaf Lamed Mem speaks of him. We can go through the rest of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, but this is the first half. I like that. The yud, the hand that works, but when he stands back, he allowed himself to go into the He could have done something different. He said, I, I could just give the word, and the legions of angels would, would rescue me from this. Mm -hmm. But he subjected himself. Why? To fulfill the prophetic words of these Hebrew letters. Mm -hmm. These Hebrew letters in this very sequence. And I tried to show you how you stop, you have an idea, you put it in motion, you have to make a decision, blah, blah, blah. It all fits because it's a natural train of thought. He designed psychology. He designed the way the physics work. He designed the Moedim. And the next group of letters, starting with the Chet, which I'll show you later, shines up with the Moedim. Lines up with the seven days of creation. I showed you the first seven letters lining up with the seven days of creation, but so did this next package written as an encrypted code. This is all the proof that it's his stuff. It's his language. It's his shem. It's his heart. It's his ideas. Everything in the alphabet belongs to Ehye. I am that which I determined to be. This is what he determined to be. I am what I shall be. I shall be that which I determined to be. So Aleph, let me show you this last thing before we take a break. Ehye. Aleph. I will be, or I will express, pay myself, and what I made, how it appears. What is evidenced by the fact that I made it is the evidence that I am the guy who planned it. That's one way to read Ehye. I will express myself in the creation as it is made to appear. Ehye. And that's like this God. What you see is what you get. It just is. Then he says, Asher, Aleph Shin Resh, which is a straight line, which also means who, that, which, or whatever. Straight, authentic, valid, to authenticate. Ehye, Asher, Ehye. So this symbolic, a dot, a straight line connected to another dot, is kind of like this graphic picture of Ehye, Asher, Ehye. And it's also in Ehye. As I've planned, so shall it be. Well, that's also Aleph Tov. Beginning the beginning and the end. This one identical to that one. Go back to the beginning and see a model of what it's going to be at the end. What I'm saying is that once you start seeing this, you realize this was all planned out. And it's all miraculously, mysteriously just plugged into the Hebrew alphabet. No coincidence. And then this is just the beginning. I'm just trying to show you the elements of what's in the letters. So that every time you go back and read a word, you can take any one of these letters and plug in these equivalents of meaning and see the word as a whole different thing than just simply reading the translation level. It's astounding. And as you do this, your mind is restored. You are brought back to health if you choose this life. Or you can say, yeah, that skull sure fascinates me. <laughs> and that's what people choose because they don't see this so I think going back to the I and Dal and I and Tav of Daniel 12 
I think that this stuff has been hidden until the time that we're willing to recognize the truth of who the Messiah is. And I'm showing you, this is in the Hebrew alphabet, you who watch in this film, it's not Christianity, it's Yahweh. It has nothing to do with Christianity. It has nothing to do with Judaism. These Hebrew letters don't belong to the Jews. It has nothing to do with it. This is reality. If Daniel was told to change the orthography so that we couldn't see this for some reason until now, then woo-hoo! Just think. If the biggest big shot of heaven, Gabriel, talked to one of the biggest big shots of earth, Daniel, to hide it. What you now see is a bigger deal because it's seeing it. This is a greater event than Daniel when he was told to hide it. Yeah. <laughs> this is a spectacular occasion. Yeah. Amen. So what do we do? Well, that's, that's up to you. What do you do? Well, you, you learn it. You hear it. You, you shema, you shemer, you hear it, you do. You put it into practice. What do you, how do you put it into practice? Well, that's the rest of this stuff. But here's the thing. I can show you how Boker, being the morning, also plays into some of this stuff. Let me just say this. We're just about to end. Let me show you how, how this might play into it. Who cares whether the day starts at morning or evening? Remember it was a fractal pattern? Okay. I've heard it said that because it's a fractal pattern, and because the day starts at a rev, which is a very short time before it's dark, this being the edge of the millennium, this being we're just now finishing six millenniums, 6,000 years of mankind's life on earth, and some people will argue with that, but whatever, right? Let's look at this pictures. This be dawning of the seventh millennium. So what we have to expect is an incoming darkness. The new world order, the big bad boys, U.S., U.N., U.K., U.S.S.R., whoever is behind them, the World Bank, all these guys, they get to rule. And they're just going to come with this fist, with this boot, because now we have the first half of the millennium of overwhelming darkness, because that's where the millennium starts, because it's a fractal pattern of the day. Oh, wait a minute. No, a day starts at Boker, doesn't it? So let's just impose that picture. What we have is Yahweh reigns. Yahweh's going to kick their butt. They got nothing because he is just now starting because we're just now opening up our eyes with Kufsadi to be his people that he's always dreamed of, that he's of had a passionate heart of desire for that he's never had yet. Adam blew it. Cain and Abel blew it. The, up until Noah, they blew it right out of the ark. Boom, you got the Tower of Babel, you got Nimrod, you got then the 12 tribes pumped out and spun off, and Jeroboam all promised you the kingdom like David. Oh, really? A poop state goes into idolatry of Dan and Bethel. You stupid jerk! Well, it's persisted ever since. Yeshua came to get. Uh, you got Constantine. Oh, gosh. Another 2,000 years. Well, here we are. Really? We have the darkness to look forward to? Or do we have the break of day of Yahweh Zavot? Hallelujah! You'll say what you, you'll, you'll have what you say as you, as you ponder in your heart, so it is unto you. What did Yeshua say? According to your faith? Don't say the giants are too big. I've given you the kingdom. I've given you the land. They're going down. And then what do we hear from our preachers? Messianic or otherwise, oh, the darkness is coming. No, that's not what he said. So if you choose to hold on to this picture of Boker, let me put it this way. I would rather stand in front of him one day having been killed and say, gee, why didn't you save me? Gee, I, I, I thought you were going to save me. Rather that than stand in front of him one day and he said, why didn't you believe me? Oh. If for some reason he does empower the bad guys, whatever. But I read the story that no, the bad guys can pound their chest. We'll get to Daniel 2 next time. <laughs> Goliath was raging, mocking the Elohim of Israel. And David said, who do you think you are? Your head's going to... 
that sword you're flashing at me, it's going to take your own head off in about five minutes from now. These guys, we could go on and on a story, but they, it doesn't matter how big they are, how many F-16s and tanks they have, just doesn't matter. This is the Ab of the heavens and the earth, and we are his people. Amen. Volker's coming. Volker's here.